Henry the Seventh had successfully established um, monarchical authority by 1509, uh, assessed the validity of this view. The reason why I think this is a nice question is, well, in general, Henry the Seventh is one that people like the most. People love talking about Henry the Seventh, uh, but also the fact that it really does allow us to just talk about anything really for Henry the Seventh. We can discuss all kinds of different things. So like with most what we're going to do is um, we're not going to argue um, we're not going to um, structure this question chronologically like we did with the last question we're going to just go back and forth on one side versus all the arguments on the other side you probably could make the um, you could do this chronologically you could do a paragraph on Henry the Seventh's um, successes and failures uh, and his early establishment of his of his dynasty, you know, the early pretenders to the throne, the Battle of Stokefield, all these kind of things, at the Battle of Bosworth as well. You could then talk about the sort of middle of his reign, coming up into the 1500s, um, and then you could talk about the end of his reign, you know, uh, 1500 to 1509. You could split the essay like that. However, in this question, what I'm going to do is split it by doing one slide on all of the reasons why he had successfully established monarchical authority and all the reasons why he had not. So are there any points anybody would like to bring up first before we move on to the slides and start looking at all the different things? Any points anybody can give me for this question? What, what kind of things would you want to write about? So if you were seeing this question in an exam or you were given this question by a teacher, uh, what would you say? What would what the first thoughts that would come into your mind about how you would go about answering it? Just as I reset the clock, hang on. Back to half an hour. Give myself half an hour on this. If there are no points, we're going to go into them. Um, and we'll go effectively you can talk about anything can you approach this thematic yeah you can you can approach this thematically yeah you could approach this thematically as well so there are actually three ways in which we could answer this question so we could answer it question we could answer it firstly by talking about on one hand we could do it chronologically like i've just mentioned and like we've just done with the um with the first question okay you could also talk about it um you could also talk about it just going back and forth on one side or the other. So make a list of points on one hand and then make a list of points on the other hand. Um, that's how we're going to do it on, on for this question. But you could also do it thematically. You could talk about how uh, you could make one argument, uh, one paragraph on um, you know his consolidation of power and his um, you know removal of pretenders, for example. You could do a paragraph on his foreign policy and you could do a, foreign, a paragraph on his maybe his government and his finances or maybe society or maybe religion etc 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 you can do you can do it however you want really what we're basically what this question is basically asking us is how successful was henry the seventh that's really what he's asking, what we're asking because we could make any um failures of his a point against his establishment of of authority if that makes sense we could we could we could frame it in whatever way we want what kind of points has anybody got? He successfully defeated pretenders, threat to the throne, like Simnel and Warbeck. Yep, we're going to talk about that. Um, how he consolidated his power in the nobility. Yes, we can talk about... Th that's another point we're going to bring up. Um, the nobility, uh, his relationship with it. Um, we can also talk about the fact that... Uh, what's it? His marriage to uh, Elizabeth of York also unified the houses. Exactly. Um, hang on. Okay, so these are all the different points that we can make. Easily make these points as well. So let's talk first on the one hand, it had success, he had successfully established authority. You could argue he never fully felt quite at ease, paranoia seemed through amount of attainders he issued. Exactly. Okay, all of these points are brilliant points because these are all points that I've got. So, um, you know, whenever that we're all on the right track. So, let's look at the reasons why he had. So, the first point you could make um, is quite a simple point, is that it, he had established his authority just by the virtue of the fact that his succession, he you know, he had a successful succession of Henry VIII as his king uh, following the death in 1509. 
So obviously, whatever he was doing was working. This is obviously a positive um, thing that he did. Um, you could also make the argument that his use of Parliament and acts of attainders were um, very good, a very good way of of rewarding and, and punishing um, different um, members of the nobility and different members of society in order to be able to effectively control them. Now, somebody made the argument that um, this could be used as a, an argument for why he never really felt at ease, and that's true. So you could use this p piece of evidence here, and you can go back and forth on it. You could talk on the one hand, okay, that um, the Parliament and the Acts of Attainders uh, were used to control his foreign policy and were, were successful at... Uh, sorry, not his foreign policy. Control, his, uh, control people within his nobility, for example. Okay. But you could also, uh, on the other hand, talk about it how it, he was never really at ease with with the nobility. He always knew the potential of someone usurping his 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 uh, crown. Obviously, this is probably partly due to the fact that uh, he was someone who had usurped uh, Richard the Third. So you know, he probably you know didn't want anything to happen to him like what happened to his predecessor. Another point you could talk about when we're looking at the successful establishment of authority, uh, of his monarchical authority, is obviously his foreign policy. We know how cautious his foreign policy was. Um, he wanted to remain peaceful, which he did for you know 99% of his reign. He also um, married off all of his children to different members of um, the royal families of, of Europe. Um, we have things, you could make a number of points. You could talk about the fact that you know the 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 terms of the Treaty of the Taples, how successful that was. You could talk about the fact that uh, the you know the initial um, terms that were met when we're talking about the Treaty of Medina del Campo. We could talk about relations with Brittany. We could talk about relations with Scotland. All of these different things. You can really go into a lot of detail for effectively an entire paragraph when we're looking at um, his foreign policy. Henry's foreign policy is a brilliant one. We can also make the argument that um, he established authority due to his um, relationship with um, with the Catholic Church. Okay. Okay. So, um, one point we can talk about. Yeah, like we mentioned, the Catholic Church. So, the Church was really a, a, the key uh, when it comes to the establishment of of authority during this period. Okay. Because um, it was seen, obviously seen, that the 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 powers of the king came from the um, came from God, the divine right of kings, and obviously God, um, the authority of of God, it comes really is closely linked hand in hand with the idea of the authority of of the church and religion. So the church um, in establishing the authority of monarchy was very important, and Henry did this obviously by um, crowning. Uh, crowned by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Okay, we also have people like Morton and Fox, who played very key roles as his advisors within council and within the, within the court. Okay, so you could talk about the fact that he saw himself as a, um, you know, as some has his power stemming from God, uh, not through through the popular opinion or whatever. You could also make the point that he was he deliberately chose to be coronated. Um, before he called his first parliament this was a symbolic way of saying uh, you know my authority my power my you know my authority as king comes from god um, the divine right of kings it doesn't come from parliament so we see that we see these little kind of tricks that um, heavily links henry the seventh's reign um, to the um, religious authority that existed at the time and so obviously therefore extending his monarchical authority Okay, so what points can we talk about when we're looking at ways in which he had not successfully established monarchical authority? What kind of evidence do people have? Any kind of points on the, on the counter to this, uh, any kind of counterpoints? 
there are a few counterpoints. We can talk about a number of different things. I think on the whole, um, this are uh, this this essay is it would lead me towards arguing that he had successfully established monarchical authority rather than than he hadn't. Okay, I I, I generally would would lean more towards the more towards him being successful than being unsuccessful. So when we're looking at when we're looking at um, ways in which we could argue against the proposition which was in the question, um, we could talk about his relationships with nobles and the nobility. So we know already that Henry was very cautious of the nobility. He had only very few trusted advisors, people like the Earl of Oxford, for example, uh, and he attempted to bypass the elites. Okay, to try and prevent any kind of challenge um, from uh, what he would, uh, you know, what were described as over mighty nobles. He used churchmen and laymen through his council, uh, through the council learned uh, in the law, and uh, really was only partially successful in doing in this. Okay, he also exploited prerogative rights, which would cause anger and frustration among the nobility. So his really his relationship with the nobility is one point that you can you can really um, you can you can really hammer home um, as being problematic. Okay, that's one of the points that we can talk about. You could talk obviously about the fact I think somebody has mentioned it as well he successfully defeated pretenders. So you could when we're talking about the fact that he successfully defeated pretenders, we could um, structure that argument by beginning. With saying that he, the fact that he had challenges um, to his throne in the first place was a sign that his authority wasn't as strong as you know as it was as it was made out. That's one of the points that we could make, because the fact that he had pretenders um, uh, led to um, the fact that he had pretenders. Uh, led to the fact that um, you know, led to the fact that he was not established. He wasn't as, as seen as an established authority, and obviously, the fact that he has a, he had a weak claim to the throne in the first place um, uh, was something that is important. Okay, but then obviously, on the other hand, as people have already mentioned in the comments, um, even though he had challenges to the throne. The fact that he was able to successfully defeat every single one of them. Don't forget, there were quite a few. You've got the the, um, you have got the Staffords, okay. You've got the Earl of Warwick. You've got Perkin Warbeck. You've got um, Simnel, Lambert Simnel, and the Battle of Stokefield. All of these different things. Um, he was successful in defeating all of them, which you know lends lends credence to the fact that he was established monarchical authority. He was able to establish his monarchical authority by defeating these people. So you could really go back and forth on this piece of evidence here. You could go on the one hand, um, you know, the f the very fact that there were challenges to his throne in the first place, you know, causes one to be concerned about whether or not he established uh, the monarchy. But then you could go on the other hand and say, well, even though he had challenges through pretenders, um, he was still able to successfully defeat every single one. Perkin Warbeck also received support from foreign powers, uh, so you could say the foreign powers in the exactly. So that's a very good point. So Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel as well. So you know Perkin Warbeck uh, and Lambert and Lambert Simnel. Um, they both uh, received um, mainly from uh, Margaret of Burgundy. Uh, they both received um, support from foreign powers. So Henry the Seventh wasn't necessarily seen. Uh, his dynasty wasn't ex necessarily at the start of his reign. His dynasty wasn't seen as um, you know popular or abroad, and the fact that he was able to um, withstand these kinds of challenges from abroad shows that you know his his he had a strong claim, a strong um, uh, monarchical authority. Okay, that's one of the points you could definitely make. Okay, they did not accept him as rightful uh, as rightful king at all. You could obviously also talk about the the Yorkish uh, and the the Cornwall um, rebellions, rebellions uh, during this period of time. This these were obviously in um, a direct um, challenge to his taxation, um, 
his taxation using extraordinary revenue from Parliament. Now, obviously, this is also you can sort of tangentially relate this to the first, to the other point that we've just made here, where um, these, uh, while being um, relatively um, relatively quite large rebellions, they were both quashed successfully. And you could also make the argument that these rebellions, um, while they were, you know, rebelling against the king, they were not dynastic in nature. So, dynastic in nature. And what I mean by dynastic in nature was they were challenging. They were challenging his um, decision um, to. They were challenging his decision um, to 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 raise extraordinary revenue and to to raise taxation um, for for conflict in Brittany, uh, on the one hand. So, but they weren't against him as a, the rightful king and the rightful um, king of the throne. So you could argue, on the one hand, these rebellions show that you know there was um, social discontent um, during periods of Henry the Seventh's reign. You would argue that on the other hand. Uh, one, they were both quashed, and they were both um, they were both unsuccessful. And two, the very nature, the reason why they were rebelling, wasn't necessarily because of his Henry the Seventh uh, as a king, as the rightful king, but they were rebelling against his decision to tax uh, for for economic reasons. So you know, a number of uh, you know a great number of the peasants that were in these rebellions probably didn't even didn't really care who the monarch was. Um, he just they just cared um, that they were taxing them, so you can make that argument. Unlike the pretenders who were definitely um, making dynastic claims to the throne, they were definitely saying that he was a the, not the rightful heir; he was a usurper. You can all the, you make these points. You could also point to the fact that he didn't actually have a standing army at any uh, at any point really um, during his reign. Uh, or at least towards the end of his reign by 1509 there was not really a standing army and really this is a very um, important point so the military security of the crown um, wasn't very successful even though his foreign policy was relatively peaceful okay there was no standing army and the king was generally just very dependent on the individual armies of nobles now we have a problem with that because as we've already mentioned up here as we've already mentioned up here okay he didn't really have the the, the most positive relationship with the nobility anyway so if he you know was distrustful uh, mistrustful and um, you know cautious about the nobility but at the same time he also was dependent on the army of nobles then you can see where this this becomes problematic because he had no way of protecting himself against the nobility except through um, acts of attainder and uh, bonds and recognizances and all these kind of different things so this is a point that you could also make and then the final point i want to talk about is that some people would argue that it wasn't really uh, an establishment of authority or it wasn't even necessarily Henry's authority that was established. It was more the work of people like Bray and then especially Epson and Dudley, who would use bullying tactics, who would um, use extraordinary revenue and taxation and bonds and recognizances to um, to basically um, extract money out of the nobility, extract money out of people, and generally um, gave this sort of aura of, of, of negativity within the court. And obviously this was responded to with Henry VIII by executing Epson and Dudley. So you could make the argument as well, that def definitely make the argument as well, that Epson and Dudley and, and, and Bray um, were the people that were really, um, you know, the ones who were able to secure Henry VII's um, monarchical authority. It wasn't necessarily Henry VII himself. So these are the points that we could talk about. So, are there any other points anybody would like to? Um, any other, any other points? Are there any other points that anybody would like to um, bring up for this? Because there are 
you know any any other things because effectively what we could do is talk about everything in Henry the Seventh Reign. Like I mentioned at the start when we looked at this question, like I mentioned at the start, when it comes to um, the phrase establishing monarchical authority, we could basically just you know rephrase that and say, and we could rephrase the whole question as effectively saying, as asking us how successful was Henry the Seventh. Because I could, any point that you make, any piece of evidence that you give me that is relating to um, something that was successful of his, let's say the Treaty of the Taples, or let's say his defeat, at, uh, his victory, sorry, at the Battle of Stokefield, all of these points, you could go, well, this is an establishment of monarchical authority. And as long as you explain why, and it's very easy to explain why, any success strengthens his position as as leader and as the uh, as the 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 heir of uh, the the king, and therefore strengthens his dynasty, and you know by extension strengthens his monarchical authority. So any point that you really want to write about, you could write about anything. I just given a number of points here that we can that we can go on we can go back and forth on so before i so i'm just going to um what i'm going to do is i'm going to go over this again one more time just really quickly um recap the points that we've made in this question and if anybody has any questions about um this question here this exam question here is monarchical the same as dynastic effectively for the, for the for for the purposes of this question here yeah so a dynasty is is you know is is the is the reign of a of a family of a family of, of monarchs so the the tudor dynasty would be henry the seventh henry the eighth edward mary and elizabeth and then we go into the the stuart dynasty with um you know james charles james um william and uh, uh, william and mary and then anne and we can carry on and carry on for example, the you know the, the 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 dynasty, the House of Windsor, the dynasty that we exist in now, we have um, you know Edward, George, Elizabeth, George, all these different people. So you could definitely argue that his ability to establish the dynasty um, is almost is is causally linked with his ability to establish monarchical authority. They're basically the same thing. So these are all the points that we can make here. So just going over it one more time, um, you have the fact that he had uh, the different points we can make when it comes to successfully establishing authority. We can look at the fact that the just by nature, just by virtue of the fact that his succession um, of it, the succession of his son Henry VIII as king, without really any hiccups or anything like that, there was not really any, um, there wasn't any kind of discontent that took place um, when Henry VIII became king shows that Henry the Seventh had effectively solidified his his dynasty. The use of Parliament and acts of attainders were very successful on his behalf, um, being able to control his nobility. However, I have noticed that in the chat people have mentioned the fact that um, you could argue that the acts of attainders shows that he was never really at ease, uh, which is quite a nice way of phrasing it. He was never really at ease. He was always a bit paranoid when it comes to when it comes to this kind of thing. Obviously, we've got his foreign policy. His foreign policy was, um, on the whole, very, very successful. You could make an entire paragraph about Henry the Seventh's uh, foreign policy, um, paying close attention, playing close, playing, paying close attention. Sorry, to um, his mar marriage alliances. So the marriage of for the Treaty of Medina del Campo, which you know married off Arthur um, to um, Catherine of Aragon, for example etc 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 you could then obviously talk i think this is one that um i don't think many people um picked up on but his relationship with the catholic church um showed um you know gave across the idea that his um authority as monarch came from and stemmed from the divine right of kings so you've got the fact that he was coronated before he called his first parliament, sort of symbolically showing that his authority comes from God. And you've got also the fact that he was, um, you could have also got the fact uh, that he was crowned by the Archbishop of Canterbury and he had a number of religious figures, people like Fox and Morton, um, as advisors um, in his council. 
And then on the other hand, obviously we've got the points like his relationship with nobles and the nobility. He was always distrustful and rather paranoid of, of the nobility. Okay. And we've also got the fact that he was challenged. He had a number of challenges. And people like Perkin Warbeck, Lambert Simnel, the Staffords, the Earl of Warwick, etc., etc. All of these different things. But then obviously you can counter that by saying, despite the fact that we have all these pretenders and we have all these um, people trying to claim um, the throne and claim that he is illegitimate and he is a usurper, um, none of them were successful. They all failed. The rebellions in Cornwall and Yorkshire, again, the Yorkshire Rebellion and the, Corn uh, the Corn Cornish Rebellion were, uh, you know, challenges, uh, you know, challenges to, to his, um, his policies of taxation. But then you can, again, you can flip that and go, well, despite the fact that they were challenges, um, they were not necessarily challenges to the Henry the Eighth attack to Henry the Seventh as, as king, to his royal, uh, to his royal supremacy. But they were challenges to the fact that he was um, doing, you know, quite extraordinary taxation and all these different kinds of things as well. The lack of a standing army and his reliance on the nobility. Um, you know, lends credence to the fact that if he if he relied on his nobility to protect him in any kind of conflict situation, but he was also distrustful of his nobility, then we have a problem there because you know it it leaves him open to to some kind of attack. And then finally, we got the impact of uh, of Bray, Epson, and Dudley. You know, the unpopular figures um, within. Um, you know, within his council and his court. So that's really it for this um, stream. If anybody's got any questions, anybody's got any um, points you'd like to note, um, anything really at all, um, you know, I'll stay around for a couple more minutes just to answer any questions um, covering these both of these questions, uh, both these exam questions here. Okay, just before we finish up, because we are coming up to the hour. So are there any questions? On the whole, I would argue that those two questions are very nice. the The foreign policy question was a very uh, was a very nice one. If I had an exam, I would be happy with the, both of these questions. How would you avoid it becoming too narrative? Well, there there are, there are different. Um, generally speaking, when if I was going to um, if I was going to answer the question that we've just we just went through, um, I would I would probably go uh, for either a thematic response like you've said, or go for a chronological um, structure. I probably wouldn't answer the question how it how it, I presented it here. I just wanted to present all the arguments on one hand and then all the arguments on the other hand. Okay, so. In reality, uh, thematic or chronological is probably the two best ways of going about it. So, um, so when we talk about obviously when we talk about thematic, you can do a you can do a, a section on, on on his consolidation of power, and then a section on his foreign policy, and then a section on his society. I personally would probably go for chronological. Now I think about it, because you could do a paragraph on his early reign. You could do a paragraph on his consolidation of power, sort of um, 1485 to the, maybe 1490, that kind of um, period. And then you could do a paragraph on um, 1490 to 1500. And then you could do a paragraph on 1500 to 1509 and sort of analyse his successes and failures in each one. But yeah, either way, thematic or, or chronological would be fine. Would it be possible to, for you to go over Stalinist society and Russia side? of the course yes of course um we have just finished um the lessons on collectivization hang on let me just let's find out when we're going over stalinist society we've just done collectivization and the impact of collectivization for stalin uh, industrial developments uh the five-year plans um, the strengths and weaknesses of said five-year plans. Um, cult of personality. The economic condition of the union. 
yeah, we will definitely get on to um, society at some point as we do the videos. We do the video the for the Russia videos are every Monday, as you probably know, and then we do um, we try to get out a, a British Empire question, a British Empire lesson every every Wednesday, but they're they're a lot more complicated, and we also do politics questions as well. But yeah, we definitely will um, do Stalinist society. Any other any other questions? anybody would like to um, raise before we finish okay well if there are no more questions um, if there are any questions feel free to just put them in the chat as the stream is finished uh, I'll cut here we go I'm not sure if you've done a live stream for Nazi Germany but if you haven't would it be possible yes uh, yes so the the really the problem with A level history is that everybody is doing a different topic. Some people are doing Tudors and um, and Russia. Some people are doing Tudors and Nazi Germany. Some people are doing Stuarts and Russia. Some people are doing some people are doing um, uh, British Empire and and China uh, for history. So it's it's difficult to to be able to cater for everybody uh, all at once in one stream. So what we do is we put um, polls up after at the end of each stream, um, to um, you know to see what people are people want um, next, what people are going to be voting for. So um, we'll put a poll up at the end of this, uh, at the end of this stream, and we will cycle through every single every single one because once we have done uh, you know say we've done we've just done Tudors, we won't put Tudors in into the poll this week. We'll just put in Nazi Germany and maybe a couple of others and see which one's which but we will get round to every single um, topic eventually at some point um, Nazi Germany will be you know either the, the next week or the week after without a doubt okay well thank you everyone um, for coming um, oh just just on time thank you everyone for coming um, see everyone next week